C4D? What? Yeah, I got C4D again for another month. I had to fix some things with my glass pack to make it easier for Mac users to use. So now Mac users can just open up the file and drag it in. But anyway, what we're going to talk about in here is just going from C40 to Unreal. I recently uploaded a video about my uh, using the Grayscale Gorilla Path Tracer stuff with um, some assets and stuff in Unreal. And a lot of people were talking about why, they're, you know, when they use Unreal, all their stuff looks video gamey, kind of like this. But a lot of people apparently just really don't know about path tracing, which instantly makes it look so much better. Now, there are limitations of path tracing and things which we'll cover briefly in this video, but I just wanted to talk about kind of just kind of a basic workflow and, and get you thinking about C4D and Unreal Engine together for motion graphics and stuff because a lot of people didn't know that Path Tracer inside of Unreal is totally free. If you don't know what Path Tracer is, Path Tracing is exactly the same kind of rendering that Octane is. Um, so it's just a different way of doing light bounces. Um, but it's not quite real time, but you can see, you know, this is pretty good. Uh, it's, you know, pretty noisy ish when you're working around, but you still can do it. You can still, you know, take your lights and moving them around and stuff in real time and figure them out. When you see it, you don't have to wait for it to render or anything. And according, again, this is going to be dependent on your GPU. I'm on a 5090. So this kind of stuff works very fast, but just so you know a lot of people didn't really know that this was even an option like things like gobos and stuff and unreal you didn't a lot of people didn't un understand that that was something you could do and there's some things out let you know what's possible with this so i've just opened up c4d to create something really quick and easy that only cpd c4d can do um so i used a gear uh then i extruded it made it a shape then i'm adding a twist to it because i like to do twists like this on uh, objects like this i just literally just did unreal engine controls but I like having these like weird fong breaks across the top because when you throw in this instead of a subsurface, it gives you like these little um, natural looking cloth things you can kind of mess with. And it gives you these little wrinkles like it's like this cool cloth fold. So a little tip there if you do want to, to fake little cloth entrances, uh, folds and things, you can do that with just bad geometry. But yeah, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, we can do something kind of it's like a little small twist like that, but you can see it's created this cool kind of like uh, wrinkle effect, like a leather couch kind of thing. So we'll just do something very simple like that. Now, what do we do? Okay, we'll make this an editable object here. But let's say we don't want to. Um, that's fine. We'll do it like that because you can always do it non-destructively or whatever. But all you have to do is use Cineware for Unreal, which is available right here in the Maxon app. Cineware for Unreal. And then inside of Unreal Engine, which is free again, uh, you go to edit and then plugins. And inside of here, you type in Cineware and make sure that Cineware by Maxon is on. It says it needs to have 2026 for this to work because they've updated it. So real quick, updated two months ago in the new like season drop or whatever, they're talking about the Cineware uh, updates and stuff like that. So the way it works, very simple. It just basically allows Unreal Engine to support .c4d projects. So, um, but yeah. So basically there was a version that everything used DataSmith before, and there are differences between the two and they're labeled clearly here. Redshift lights and cameras supported in more Redshift focused in the newer version, which is good. Now, legacy lights, cameras, materials, not as supported, okay? That's totally fine. Direct link, not supported, which is a bummer because you used to be able to just change things and it would just update. Um, hopefully they interp and bring that back in. But the fact that you can just take your C40 file with Redshift stuff and put it in is impressive. So let's just go ahead and test that. And then character animation is now supported, but exposure parameters via takes, not supported. So you guys can read. Um, drag and drop into content browser actually is supported. So it has all the, the tools, what you need to do. You need to go to the direct link, say okay. And then Unreal, you do the direct link import and grab that, cool. Mac apparently has issues. That's, of course, that's always the case. I'm just kidding. All right, uh, but Mac users, Mac users can figure that out. So let's throw a material on here. Let's grab a material from the asset browser here. Cool. There's our scene. Looking good. All right. So now what we can do is go to Redshift, go to Extensions, Unreal Direct Link, Export to File, Data Smith. Hit the little gear, say OK. Boom. Choose where you want to save this. Okay, while that's going, we'll just go ahead and open up Unreal instead of Unreal. We'll click this little icon right here, little plus button, go down to Datasmith and file import and our Datasmith right here. Okay, 
and we'll choose where to put that. I'm going to put that in the Derek folder. Boom. Import lights, cameras, animations, everything, light map, resolution. Good to go. Okay. Bringing that in. Oh, yeah. There it is. Cool. So even our Redshift light was here, but it looks like, oh, there it is. Sweet. Our materials are coming through. Everything is looking decent. Our colors are, our lights are exploding in brightness here. There we go. Now it looks like the colors of our fabric didn't come through because I would assume that because like the fabric materials, like, but I, I'd say anything that uses stuff like sheen, um, things that aren't normally on a normal and a different diffuse model and stuff like that, those are probably not going to come through, but we can probably still fix it or use whatever. But it's cool that we have our light here and our floor came through and everything and looks actually fairly decent. Um, and we're using our redshift light. Hit G to make things show up and we can raise this up a bit. Let's just replace and or fix the material on this. It looks like our fabric just didn't come through right at all, um, which is okay. We'll go ahead and click this icon, the folder icon to bring that up. And you can see we have it here. We can double click that to open it up. So it just came through dark and shiny, but if you open up the material here, we have all the same attributes and controls that we normally do. We just need to increase the diffuse weight because um, it actually turned that off. Now, I would say the roughness here is probably wrong. So we're going to say use the roughness map, but the map didn't come through. So I'm not sure. So we're not going to use the map. We're just going to use the reflection roughness of like 0.6. All right, so what we can do, first thing you want to do when you bring in a scene is you want to make sure you have a PPV or a post-process volume right here. And it's this here, and I have a file uh, that you can download on my Patreon or you can buy it if you don't want to do the whole month. But you can use code FALL50, so it's like $2.50 if you want this uh, scene. And you can just, basically, it'll download you the scene. We'll open up Epic here. It'll download you the scene, and what you can do is just open this up and then migrate it into whatever project you want. So once you open it up, you can just, it'll pop up in here. Once you have something here, you can just right click it and tell it to migrate inside of asset actions and then migrate and basically put that in whatever project you want. It's just like copy and pasting, and it'll work um, in 5.6 and up. Anyway, inside of that, what we would get, which actually I have here, is you'll get a level called a PPV level. So this is what comes in, comes with a PDF as well. And you just simply grab this post-process volume, copy, and then go back to your level. Oops. And go back to your level and paste. And instead of here, you wanna make sure that you go in here, make sure infinite is on. Sometimes it unchecks. And that just makes sure that that post-process volume affects your entire scene, not just the uh, inside the square. So now we're good. Now we have Lumen and everything set up. So now path tracing is set up as well. Everything is good so that when we come in here and we click from lit to path tracer, it will work. Now we're going to get uh, different lighting and stuff because the way path tracer is working is doing more bounces, things like that. I'm not going to deep dive into path tracer in this video, um, but basically it works like you think it would. Like you'd be more, you'll be more familiar with the way the path chaser works than Lumen works, but you'll be blown away with the speed and quality of Lumen, um, which is nuts. Uh, but yeah, let's just go ahead and add a camera. Boom. Look through that camera. Pilot the camera. There we go. Drive it around. You can see already we're looking much, much better. But we come in here, go to exposure, our camera exposure. And I always like to set it to manual so I can adjust it however I want, like so. Cool. And then we can just do a little click to focus real quick. Boop, nice. And the cool thing, you have this like nice plane that shows up so you can see exactly where you're focusing on. But yeah, there we go. Now, obviously I think like I wanted to uh, affect the, the tiling of the UV. So if I click my psych wall, I have backdrop here. We can see we brought that in and you scroll down here and your material is gonna be on there. Right here, concrete panel. And so you have it here, and what you can do is double click that, and we can go down here to the UV, UV, UV offset tiles, to check box that, and now we can control the amount that we're tiling. So let's tile it six by six, and there we go. Now we've adjusted the size of that. So, I mean, there you go. Um, 
you might be wondering, okay, well, that seemed like a lot of work to bring it in um, and then tweak things and stuff. It, it is a little bit, especially if you're new to it. But once you understand the flow of it, I mean, basically the way I would do it is if you're going to build things very unique and distinctly uh, and use un, uh, C4D's tools to do it, um, you just build it and you can texture it, but don't spend a ton of time texturing if you don't want to. Um, because you can make the textures inside of here exactly the same, just so you guys can see. New material, and it's exactly the same. Like you have a node, you can choose it to be a translucent node or a subsurface node, um, or you can make it be cloth or a clear coat. Actually, let's just change this to cloth. See if we can just do that preset real quick. Uh, double click this, and you may notice this is different. So it brings in a material instance, right? It's not the same. So without getting too into that, instances are like subcategories of a master control material, which I actually really like the way that works because um, it allows you to have different variants of a master control. And if you want to adjust all the variants at once, you just adjust the master control. And I really like that. So we have the C4D reference here. It's always listed down here in the parent. Open that up. And now if we wanted to, we could adjust it to be a uh, cloth material. So you can try that, but it's probably also going to ref change our concrete. And we don't want to do that. So what we want to do is copy paste to make a new material here. Double click this one, change it from opaque to cloth, apply. Okay, so we have fuzz color, stuff like that. Let's go ahead and hold three and click. And that's going to allow us to just bring up a color wheel. And we'll make like a light blue fuzz, okay? Maybe not that light blue, like that, yeah. And we'll plug that into fuzz color and hit apply. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, now we can go back into our fabric here. Double click that. And for the parent of that, we want this now to be our new one. And with this selected, we can either drag and drop it in there. And now it's going to have that fuzz around the edge and be a cloth. And we can hit save on that save that fabric so now it's going to have more of a cloth feel to it because it has a fuzz on it and it already does look a lot more like cloth so i know this tutorial is a little all over the place but i just want to get you guys thinking about like what the workflow looks like and how it can be used for yours because obviously there's a ton of different examples but so basically i mean my thoughts on it are like it's doable what the workflow requirements are that would need you to trigger that. Because if you're paying with C4D, you're going to have Redshift anyway. If you're going to have Redshift, I mean, Redshift's pretty good. Well, why not just use Redshift? Um, because, I mean, when you're bringing it on Unreal, then you can use all the Unreal assets, things from Fab, stuff like that, um, all kinds of stuff. So really depends on the needs of what you want and what you need. Uh, but like weather, things like that can be easily applied on this kind of stuff, but you can do that kind of thing in there as well. But I mean, this is great if you're building something for a game dev and you just need to build it in C4D and send it over. And game devs can be like, oh yeah, I can download a C4D file now and just open it up kind of, kind of if you have data smith. So I guess the main thing I want to know is we transition from, you know, C4D to Unreal, with all of you guys, um, what you want to know what Unreal can do. And let me just show you. Like, ask, say, hey, can Unreal do this? And I'll answer you, yes, or show you this. Like, hey, um, so, I mean, to answer a lot of questions about can it do product viz, um, absolutely. I will do an in-depth thing about that. I think people are really curious about that. And it's very simple to do. It just doesn't work exactly the same as Redshift. It has its own system and hierarchy but as far as the values and stuff they're all almost identical it's just where they are right so it's 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 annoying it's like trying to go from c4d to blender because you know it can do the things you want it to do but all the tools and buttons you know aren't where they're supposed to be and they don't do what you're, they're supposed to do so i get the frustration on, on doing it but i mean honestly there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do inside of Unreal Engine. And I think that it's a, like it's in its early stages. And it is a real competitor to the MoGraph higher-ups, especially for beginners. Like, if you dive in now and start learning now, 
in five years, I don't think you're going to be able to tell the difference between an Unreal Engine render and a C40 render. 